Well, hey guys, welcome to I'm In, Now What? Basically, the purpose of these three short talks is to give you just a foundation of what is Christianity? What is it about? What is the gospel? Who am I? What am I called to? Uh, and maybe if you're watching this, you've recently given your life to Jesus, um, or you just need a refresher, or you're like, you know what? I've been a Christian for a while, but I really just want a solid foundation of my faith. That's what these talks um, are for. And uh, before I get it started, I want you to do two things. Make sure you download and print out the fill-out sheet or the fill-in sheet um, so you can follow along. We're going to have some fill-in-the-blanks um, so you guys can pay attention, stay, uh, and, and um, keep going with us and um, fill in the blanks. And then also grab a Bible. Um, I have a lot of scripture for us. It's just going to give you such a rich foundation um, of the Word uh, and what it says about us and our faith. Um, so make sure you grab a Bible and a highlighter. So you get those three things, the fill-in-the-blank the fill in the blank sheet, your Bible, and a highlighter. Uh, but let's just get into it. Um, so this is part one uh, of this three-part series, um, and we are starting with the gospel, the gospel. This is a word that you've for sure heard if you've been in church for more than five minutes, um, but a lot of times it's one of those words. It's, we, we've heard it a bunch of times, but we don't really know what it means. But um, the core beliefs of Christianity are summed up in that word, gospel. Uh, but what does it mean? It, it's a Greek word, and it means good news. So this gospel of Jesus is literally the good news about Jesus. Um, but why is this news good? Why is the news about Jesus, why is it good? Um, it's best summed up, the gospel is best summed up uh, in the gospel of John in the New Testament, and you've for sure heard this verse, uh, but it's John three sixteen. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The truth of the gospel is that every person who has ever lived is imperfect and in need of God's forgiveness. And the Bible even says so in Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Everyone, your mom, your grandpa, your weird friend at school, uh, your uncle that you never see, you yourself, every single person that has ever existed has sinned and fallen short of God's standard. Um, and here's the issue, here's the dilemma, here's why the gospel matters, and it's this. Perfection cannot dwell with imperfection. It's a really simple thought, and I'll give you an analogy for this. Imagine, uh, you know, I had a, a crystal clear glass of water, uh, and I took a little bit of food coloring, and I just put one drop of, like, red dye uh, in a glass of water. Well, what would happen? Does the water uh, just absorb the, the dye and it make it clear? Or will it have a slight red tinge to it? Will it be, have a little bit of hint of red? Obviously, it's the latter. And it's no different um, with God. He is perfect, and he cannot dwell with imperfection because of his perfection. Um, so we need something or someone to take our imperfection off of us, to literally remove it from us so that we can dwell with a perfect God. But we're going to get back on that in a minute. Um, but I want to talk about something really quick, and it's, it's this. Where did sin, where did imperfection even come from? You know, we talked about, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. Um, you know, we're all sinners. We've done things wrong. We've missed the mark. But where did that even come from? And we have to go all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis. Uh, and we're going to be in the book of Genesis chapter 3. It says this, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you'll die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like him, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So we read this story, and you may be saying to yourself, what's the big deal? Okay, they ate some fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. Like, what's, what's the problem? Like, okay, big deal, big whoop. Um, the big deal is this. This was the first moment in all of human history, where man and woman deliberately went against what God had spoken. Uh, this was the first sin, and that word sin, S-I-N, it literally just means to miss the mark. 
It's literally this word that just means I missed the bullseye. I missed the mark. God has standards. God calls us to something. He calls us to a way of living. He calls us to holiness and to purity. And when we sin, we're missing that mark. So God placed a tree in the garden so that mankind would have the opportunity to choose. It's out of love. He literally gave us the opportunity to either choose him or to choose the world. It's important to understand that God has given every single person the chance to choose him or to not choose him. He does not force himself on anyone, but he invites us each into personal relationship with him. You may have heard it before that, you know, Christianity is, is a relationship, not a religion. And, uh, and I think, and, and I agree with that. I think it's really important to understand that we're coming into personal relationship with this God. It's not just a system that we follow and we do church and uh, we just do the, the Christian things, but no, it's a relationship that we are in with God every day and he offers us the choice. And really this first part is, this first part of this teaching is just in response to maybe a choice that you made. You chose to say, I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I want to come into relationship with God. But if I'm imperfect, if I've done things, if I've sinned, if I've missed the mark, how can I have relationship with a perfect God? And this is where John 3.16 begins to make a lot of sense and the gospel becomes real. Um, and like I said, there, if you're watching this, these teachings, if, if you're going through it, it's probably as a result of, you know, you were that one in the room that raised their hand saying, I need Jesus, I believe in him. Or maybe you, you came to camp and you realized, you know what, I'm, I've done things wrong. I need Jesus. I want to follow him. Um, and maybe you raised your hand, you said yes to him. And if so, that, that's amazing. Uh, and I want to unpack this idea for a moment um, of atonement. Now, that's a big word. It's like a big theology Bible word, right? but this word atonement, because it's really important to understand as Christians. Atonement is a fancy word that refers to God and man being reconciled through Jesus' death on the cross. Basically, that word reconciled is um, being brought back together. So atonement is the vehicle that God uses to reconcile us with him, to bring two things that were separate back into agreement and alignment. And you may be thinking, why did Jesus have to die on the cross. That's, that sounds pretty aggressive. That sounds pretty violent. Why couldn't he have just, you know, snapped his fingers and made something happen and just made it happen? Why did he have to die? And, you know, we could take a long time talking about atonement, but I want to just briefly touch on this and, and why Jesus had to die, why he had to shed his blood, why communion is even a thing, why it's important um, to understand. Um, before Jesus was even born, there was a temporary system in the Old Testament that you may have read about before if you've read uh, in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Um, and it was this system where the Israelites, God, God's people, would bring a sacrifice to this place called the tabernacle, and they would bring a sacrifice to atone for their sins. They, they would kill a sheep or a goat, or they would bring a grain offering or some kind of, uh, or a bird or something that, that, you know, they would sin in a certain way or miss the mark in a certain way, and they would have to bring a specific offering. And that was a temporary system. And in Leviticus 4.35, you get a clear picture of the process and the purpose. It says this, through this process, the priest will purify the people from their sin, making them right with the Lord. That's so important to understand, making them right with God and they will be forgiven. But that system, the old covenant, was a prophetic picture of what Jesus would do. And that's why he said in Matthew 5.17 that he came to fulfill the law um, or the Old Testament. Excuse me, the old covenant. He came to fulfill it. He said, okay, there's this whole system and I'm not gonna just tear it down, but I want to fulfill this. I wanna show you what the true meaning of this and bring it to completion with myself. That's atonement. It's Jesus standing in the gap saying, I will be the one to reconcile God and man together. And that's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No other religion, no other system. It's just Jesus. But how does it work? How does it work? Is it, I just, you know, say some words and, and poof, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm in, I was, I was going to be going to hell, but then I said a, a couple sentences and then now I'm going to heaven. Is that the, is that it? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. It's it, it, becoming a Christian isn't necessarily just saying words and you're in, but it is a simple gospel. 
It is simple good news. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. You know, I've been in youth ministry for, um, for six or seven years now, and I've had quite a few students ask me, like, how do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I'm actually a Christian? How, do I, how can I know for sure? And um, honestly, if you're asking, that's, that's a pretty good sign. But I want, to, I want you to use Romans uh, um, 10, 9, and 10 as a litmus test. And it, and it, it, it asks us a few things. Do I believe um, that Jesus died on the cross for me? Do I believe that Jesus was risen from the, from the grave? He rose from the dead. Do I believe those things? Do I believe that Jesus is Lord? I want to read that again. Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's use this as a litmus test. If you believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin, and he's Lord, and he raised you from the dead, you are saved. You're a Christian. You're in. And the beautiful thing about this um, is that becoming a Christian giving your life to Jesus, openly declaring your faith. A lot of people see it as the finish line. Okay, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I prayed the prayer. I'm in, whatever, going to heaven. Good, awesome. A lot of people see it as the finish line, but I I want to tell you it is not. It is a launch pad to an entirely new life that God wants you to live, that God invites you into. Accepting Jesus is not a finish line. It is a launch pad. So what's next? In other words, I'm in, now what? I am in, now what? I'm in with Jesus, but where do I go? What do I do? What am I called to? What am I supposed to do? What's my life now? I've given him, I've given him my everything, I follow him, but what do I do? And in part three of these teachings, we're gonna talk about what do I do and what is it, how does it affect my life? But before we do that, I wanna take a moment in part two to talk about who you are in Christ. It's so crucial to understand not just how he saved me and not just what I'm called to, but who I am. And we will dive into that entire conversation in part two. We'll see you there.